people go an hour. You'll be here four hours. All right. Well, you are live. It said, it said, you are live. It's official. It is official. Ladies and gentlemen, we We're are live. live. Nick, can you raise your volume on your microphone a little? Yes, I can. How about now? Is that better? How about now? How about now? That's good. There we go. I think that's good. I don't want to overpower you. Hey. Hey, I'm over here now. So I says to the guy, I says, wait, wait. there are three people already. Three people. You know what three people means? That means it's time for the intro. That is exactly it. That is our barometer. If there are three, at least three people here, five people. Oh, that's it. We're wasting time. We must get to the intro. The hey flames, now. the flames are the, the fl <laughs> those are my favorite part of that. It's the fire. fire ah! does it all. So, you know, you know that you're starting to develop a following when at 501, they're like, sheesh, took long enough for you to get here. Meanwhile, we were here at five o'clock and we hit live or eight o'clock, depending on what time zone you're in. Excuse me. I got to throw this. Uh, and we were here. We were here. Yes, we were. We were. You know, it just how many times did I have to click go live and then wait and then it wasn't going live and then it was like, oh, you're live. Like, oh, you clicked okay. at least six times. At least six times, you know? We already lost somebody because we're complaining, I guess. Uh, so we went from five to four really quick. So anyway, welcome back, everybody. It is Cover to Covered. My name is Mike Venezia. Uh, that other guy right over there is Nick Morocco. Straight out of the town Detroit, but he's coming over to this side of things tomorrow. So uh, welcome, uh, give you a preemptive welcome to the West Coast. And our uh, our uh, co-engineer, Roger, is of course here as usual. And for those of you that don't know what this show is, uh, that it's your first time, and I'm sure it's not, but hey, if it is your first time, this is just a music nerd show and we talk about music. And uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things today. Our main topic today, we'll be talking about soundtracks, some of our favorite soundtracks. Uh, but there's going to be a bunch of things we're talking about today. We're talking about the new releases that Nick has not gotten yet from his distributors <laughs> once again, again once again. Uh, and we'll also be giving you a little bit of a NAM preview and NAM is North American music merchants. It's a meeting that starts this Friday normally happens in January, but it's happening in June this year. And both Nick and I will be in attendance for different reasons. Yes. Uh, and then of course we'll talk about, uh, discovered, a cover song that we like as much, if not more, than the original. And we'll also discuss how to pen Roger up during these shows because I'm getting tired of him running around and bothering me every time I start talking. And we'll wrap it all up, of course, with a rollicking session of This Song Sucks, which is uh, pretty much everybody's favorite, I, I believe. So. Should be. Should be. With all that said, how you doing, man? I am doing okay. I'm running on very little sleep. Because it's Nam Week, and that's what you do on Nam Week. Is yeah, you but you're not even there yet. You're supposed to not sleep when you're at Nam. Like when you're actively in California and the parties are happening, though they'll probably be way, way more subdued this year. Yes. I don't even know if anybody's playing. I think there's a Schechter party, like Schechter Guitars party, but we'll get into that. There is um, something else going on. What else? There's oh, an we'll, get, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. That's a, that, that's a segment of the show. Right now I'm playing catch with Roger as we talk about Nam. But uh, anyway, so Nick, you are the proprietor of what store? Rock City Music Company, located and where in is that? Livonia, Michigan. We're located in Livonia, Michigan, right outside of Detroit. Got tons of great gear, pedals, amps, guitars, records, shirts, pinball machines, Funko Pops, Funko Pops, Ducky autographs. Whoa, all of it. I don't know if I want a Ducky autograph. Most but, people do not. No, I can understand why. But uh, one thing I do need to ask for those that are interested, do you have flan? You know, we're actually completely out of flan right now. The supply chain is just killing us on the flan. You need a flan bar. 
One hundred percent. We we are the only music store in the entire world that has a flan bar. I think I think that would be I think that would be great. Oh, whoa, hey, it's talking to you. Uh, yeah, I think you need a flan bar, and then Roger will definitely want to come and and hang out in Detroit for sure. I was um, hoping I was going to get to see Roger tomorrow, but I'm not going to. Yeah, it's going to be it's a tough one because even though I'm only ninety minutes away, I do stay. Uh, right by the convention center just because it makes life easier. Now, what's a bummer for me is that tomorrow failure is playing 10 minutes away from where I live. Yes. You <laughs> were I saying that failure. a couple of weeks ago. I love failure. Not, not the act of failure not like, you know, the failure of a person. I like the band failure. They are awesome. Uh, and unfortunately I'm going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to see them. Um, I'm going to kill Roger in a second though. Somebody said, Roger run free. Yes, he is running free. Um, but anyway, with that said, uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about Nam in a second. It's creeping in a lot early in the well, show. Well, because it's that, yeah, it, that's, that's the, it's like the Grammys for, uh, for this industry. Yeah, basically. Or the auto show. That's what we yeah, tell people here. that's more what it is. It's more the auto show of the musical instrument industry. That is a great comparison right there. So, um so what uh, let's start it off what are you listening to what have you been listening to this week well as i've been saying the last couple of times i'm still celebrating the uh 50th anniversary of the grateful dead's europe 72 tour takes that long as you might imagine with 24 oh shows to listen to are you going to be celebrating it the 51st year <laughs> of the 72nd 72 tour like maybe the year? 54th year oh great maybe uh we touched on ecstasy or a xtc whichever way you decide you want to pr pr pronounce it we touched on that last week with skylarking yeah. uh i've since i got into that i've really been digging deep into their catalog so right now i'm really into oranges and lemons which is the record after skylight larking uh it's great in its own way i don't know if it lives up to skylarking but not much does um and then one of the records we are going to be showcasing for the main topic has been back in heavy rotation again so i'll hold okay. off on that but it but we'll discuss it we all right we will we will hold off on that one uh great uh as for me i i gotta be honest i've still been listening to that new def leopard record that came out on friday diamond star halos um and it, it it's it's kind of, i guess and i hate to say this but mitch hedberg uh, talked about pancakes in a very similar fashion. You know, they're great uh, at the start, but by the end, you're kind of sick of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, this album starts out so great. Side one on the on the record, it's a double LP. And side one is really, really good. Like every song on side one is an unabashed hit. It's it's everything you, you'd hear all this. Um, but it, it starts to kind of dwindle a bit, like the magic disappears a little bit. And I think this is the problem with albums today. Everybody's putting out 14 track albums and yes. all this stuff. And you know what? Just not everything is a winner. You know, be a little more discerning. I hate the fact that record companies force, force people to put 11, at least 11 songs on an album. I believe that there should be some time limits involved. You know, like it shouldn't be like a 20 minute record. That's a waste of money. Like, I do agree that a lot of contracts say like 38 minutes and 11 songs or whatever. But you brought up last week about like a Van Halen Fair Warning and I think Slayer Rain and Blood. Both of those records are, are if they're not under 30 minutes, they're right there. And Slayer's is really close. Fair Warning's over 30 minutes, but, but not uh, by much. Not by much. But either way, th like, wouldn't you want a couple more songs on Fair Warning though? Like, that album's great. I wouldn't mind a couple more songs from that album. So make it 11, like cut it off at 11. It was eight. It, actually, there was no number. Then they said, well, it's at least eight. Then it's at least 10. Then it's at least 11. And that's sort of where it lives now. And I don't, I don't necessarily believe that that's a thing. I like the fact that some, some bands are just putting out EPs. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I, a couple, a couple episodes ago, I talked about uh, Mike Campbell and the dirty knobs, mm -hmm. uh, external combustion. That is a great representation of, basically following the old school uh record release mode of like 10 tracks you know 40 minutes 
all killer, no filler. I wouldn't say it's a perfect album like we were discussing last week, but it, it's refreshing in a sense because there is a lot of bands that I think, especially in the vinyl sense, are, are trying to push it to a two LP for the packaging, for the you know maybe the price point, whatever it is, or yeah. like you said, the late the label concern. And sometimes you know there's there's some there's some tankers and they usually stick them at the end. But hey, new Def Leppard and even if half of it is good. I think that's that's a winner. Half of it is good. Like that's for sure, you know, but the, the again, it's it's a lot all at once and then it just really kind of dies out for a while and there's a little, you know, couple of couple of blips on the EKG uh, that are like, "Oh yeah, that's good." All right, what's this? All right, that's good. Okay. Some of that I think too has to do with people's attention spans. I think they might just go, "Well, by the time they get to track 10, nobody's going to be paying attention anyways." I agree with you and but there aren't that many people that listen straight through these days. So let's mm -hmm. be honest, you know, and I've done it where I've listened to it straight through and I've done like, "Well, let me just pick up in the middle again. Let me not just go back to these songs that I love and beat them to death and get sick of them." And it still kind of rang the same. Like it didn't yeah. it didn't mean as much you know um uh, going back and listening to it again like all right maybe there's something no there's really there's still nothing there um not nothing let, let, let's be honest there's good songs it's there's just some not good songs it just sounds like they were filling space yeah and i think part of it had to do with the fact that you recorded a lot of things and 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 if you're a band of a certain age you don't know if you're going to put out another release i mean the average age of the guys in Def Leppard has to be mid 60s at this point right? yeah you know, i would early, say so early, yeah. early to mid 60s how many more records you're going to put out maybe just release everything who knows there, there's got to be myriad reasons why why that why that's the case and obviously they believe in it all they wouldn't have put it out so i'm not taking anything away from their integrity it's not like they were just putting songs out to put songs out in their mind, they thought they were great. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people that feel that every song on the album is great. I am not one of them. Um, but that's not taking away from the album and saying that it's a solid three and a half out of five stars. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because the, the, the songs, like I said, on side one, like the first four songs, if you have the CD, are, uh, are great. Yeah. They're great. And so it's totally worth buying, I, I, I think, 100%. We played it in the store, and it is, it is a nice... Uh, uh, I don't want to say return to form. It's just refreshing to hear yeah. new Def Leppard. That's quality. It's it's kind of like a throwback with a modern sound. It's like modern production with throwback themes. You know, it's very much a gla like a seventies glam type album in a lot of ways. Especially the song "Kick." Like that. Yes. Song, like screams T Rex. It's a great song. Uh, yeah, it's a great song. Uh, I think that personally, I think it's the best song on the record. Um, but anyway, so that's that. So that's what, that's what I'm listening to. That's what you're listening to. Now, speaking of listening Friday, new release day. Yes. Wednesday didn't get releases to show for Friday release day. <laughs> this time, I don't know if we can pinpoint whose fault it is other than, you know, hol long holiday weekend. Yeah, well, let's so. blame this one on Memorial Day. So, uh, so what do you got? What, what, what are some highlights coming out this week? So the big thing that I'm really excited for that you, if you're a vinyl fan, you've probably been getting fed ads on it. And uh, maybe you're excited as well. Prince and the Revolution Live coming out uh, from 1985 right after purple rain three lp set comes with a 16 page book tons of photos recorded on the purple rain tour this comes from the original master track master reels um so i'm sure the sound is going to be great three lps and also for the cd people out there it comes with a i believe a blu-ray so there is video oh, nice. footage of it. I don't believe the the Blu-ray comes with the LP set, but but it looks like it's going to be a quality package. Is it uh, is it Blu-ray audio and video, or is it just video? It looks like it is just video. Okay, it looks like just video. Good to know. But the but the fact that it's coming uh, from actual master tapes that would have been recorded probably from the board and stuff. Yeah. This is this is going to be a great sounding live recording from maybe prince's best era i don't know i know that's it's hard to say but a lot of it people's is. favorite i think he was operating at his absolute you know beetle mania peak at that um and the set list is great i mean you got let's go crazy 1999 take me with you 
red Corvette, Purple Rain, of course, Computer Blue, Darling Nikki, almost the entire Purple it's Rain the entire record. Purple Rain album, yeah. Yes. I mean, it's it it this is this is really gonna be great. And uh glad to see them doing a um you know prime era prince release yeah. in this fashion. So there's that. And then uh, you may remember a couple episodes ago, I talked about the Neil Young official bootleg series yep. releases that have been coming out. So there was three that were coming out in a month span. The last two are coming out this week. You got Dorothy Chandler Pavilion from 71 and Royce Hall also from 1971. So both of these have circulated in the bootleg circles but not at this quality these these were recorded for neil's archives so again coming off the master tapes they've been mastered by bernie grudman high quality lp presses of it um specifically the dorothy chandler one looks really great because it's it's uh it was recorded the last night of his seven one solo tour so songs like you know heart of gold needle and the damage done songs that would end up being huge on harvest have kind of been honed and and now they're being performed in in uh, just before they're getting recorded. So I love hearing the progression of demos to the first time it's played live to the studio track. And you, Neil Young, you know, the releases, some people say he puts too much stuff out. But if you're a Neil Young fan, it's a great time to be a Neil Young fan because you're getting all this great quality stuff. And uh, I just can't speak highly enough of the uh, pressing quality and the sound. And he, he really does take take pride in in the product he's putting out so even though you're getting a lot of it like the zappa family trust you know they've been putting out a ton of yep. stuff you're yep. getting a quality product for your money and i think that's that's the best thing you can ask for yeah it's it's important you know i mean it's one thing just to put out product it's another thing to put out good product exactly know? and um uh, it a lot of these bands, these legacy bands and artists are now digging into that back catalog, looking to see what they have left. Because again, yep. they're aging out or what have you. I mean, Kiss is a great example. They're starting these three and four LP live sets, you know, the bootlegs. Yeah. Which are not really bootlegs. They're, you know, they're soundboard just, tapes. They're soundboard tapes that they just never released and they kept them. And now they're putting them out 20 and 30 years after they, after they recorded them. And they're good. Mostly. I hope with with that with that series, I really hope they start digging into. I mean, let's face it, the prime era of Kiss of yeah. you know seventy four to seventy nine. Even if we go through Dynasty, it's like give me prime era Kiss. I don't want Virginia Beach two thousand four. Yeah, personally, that's the next one that's coming out, right? <laughs> no, the or next that one that's coming one? out is uh, ninety six Donington. So that that's is right. at least the original four. And and the first one that came out, the Tokyo Dome, that was three of the four. It was Eric Singer was playing drums. It was two thousand one, I think yep. that's from. Yep. So and that I, I mean I have it. it. I think it's great. I, I think it's a really good representation. And there's some you know choice, uh, interesting tracks that they chose on there, like "Talk to Me" with the you know Ace Frehley sort of singing. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> if you want to call it that uh, during it, but I mean that song was from freaking unmasked from, from unmasked so yeah. having any track from unmasked is kind of like huh? yes okay. especially lately where kiss has been kind of it's been the same set list for quite a while so yeah, exactly. um and yeah. even even if they were to release you know some of the um you know the bruce kulik era stuff i think the band played great live in that time and uh there's a lot of great stuff in their can that could come out that i hope that they do but you know sometimes Kiss makes decisions that aren't always supportive. Uh, well, they're not supportive of the fans. Right. That's what I that's what I think. <laughs> that's what you know, but like something like there's great footage of it on on YouTube, but like Kiss Winterland 75. Mm. Unbelievable. Like that's Kiss before Alive blows up. And they were hungry. trying. That's the whole thing. They were yes. trying. It's so. like put that out. Give me a two LP set of that because I know they have the master tapes. Give yeah. me that. Yep, yep. We shall see. Yeah. Anything else you got to recommend for uh, for this week? Give it. Give us one more. There is um the uh, the kills. The self titled album is being reissued after a long hiatus. I'm and sorry, uh, you, you hiccup there for a second. What oh shit! It? I'm sorry. The uh, the kills. The self titled oh, so album by the kills. Up. Okay. 
thought yeah, there was so, a word in there that I missed. No, they, their <laughs> self-titled album has been out of print for a long time. Unfortunately, you might be excited about this, but I'm not. Uh, Clutch, Robot, Hive, Exodus. There's a deluxe reissue coming out. All right, I'm, I'm okay with that, though it's one of the later albums. But, uh, you know, again, for me, the first four or five Clutch albums, great. After that, it's like bad versions of the first four or five, first four or five Clutch albums. Um, but I know you hate them, so I just won't yes. even wax poetic about it. Yes. But Transnational Speedway League is the shiz. Just saying. Not to me. Okay, great. So, moving on. Um, so we talked about what we're, uh, what we're listening to. We talked about some of the highlights coming up from this Friday and uh, we'd talk about more if there were albums to show, but they're just, yes, they're, they're, I promise next week we'll have them. There you go. Uh, and then, uh, and then the week after next week is record store day two of the year. And we'll yes. have a special going, uh, I believe the, that would be the 15th is the Wednesday yes. before. So we'll, uh, we'll do a, a review, a preview of record store day on on the 15th next week i have no idea what the topic is yet but we'll, we'll figure that one out probably be a nam uh, debrief yes. but uh, speaking of nam so again both nick and i are going to be at nam uh starting uh we're both going to be in anaheim tomorrow the show starts on friday goes through sunday and as nick appropriately described it it's basically the car show for musical instruments and uh i work for a guitar company so i'll be working nick will be looking for companies to pick up and carry in his store. Yep. So it's a great dance that happens. And being that it was pushed back because of COVID, it might be lightly attended. I'm not sure what this is going to be like. I am very interested to find out, but I am happy to be going to see some of my friends in the industry and kind of get back to, I, I mentioned it in past episodes, get back to something a little bit more normal in this industry. Yes. Uh, but what, what are, you know, what are you excited about seeing? Like, who are you looking to visit that you want to like take something away from? So it, I, I want to touch on what you just mentioned about, it, I think there's a lot of um, people on the edge of their seat to see how is this attended and how does it go? Because I think for those that don't know, you need to understand that this convention is usually the be all end all of this industry between yeah. the companies that are there, the artists that perform the products that get launched. It's all made at NAM, yeah. and, uh, for them, you know, we, we went in 2020 just before the, uh, the pandemic really kicked into full effect. I remember yeah. seeing the, uh, news stories there about how yeah. this, this was kind of picking up the, yeah. the coronavirus, and all of us were kind of like, Oh, I wonder what that's going to be all about. I mean, I don't think anybody would have ever dreamed it would have been what it ended up being. Yeah. Um, but you know, that show was, I don't think I've ever seen more people at it, to be honest. I mean, you've been going to these, these, longer than i have uh, this if i would have gone consecutively this would be my 10th so i think i'm at seven or eight because there was a couple i missed and then obviously covid but it just seems like it continues to pick up steam and pick up steam so what we're going into i think like you're saying will be refreshing to get a piece of that normalcy and that excitement of being a part of nam and getting to see all the new products and seeing people that you don't get to see unless you're at nam a lot of these companies are based in california you know yep. some of the companies we deal with i only get to see my reps face to face at nam so yeah, for a lot that of people that's the case yeah you're not the only one in that boat you know because companies don't live in every state they live usually in one and if they're big enough they have salespeople that either go and visit their their territory or live somewhat regionally to go drive and visit them but even then you you may see them four times a year sometimes twice right. a year sometimes once a year depending on how remote you are to to them and it's not for not wanting to it's just you got it's travel, hard you know yeah. it's hard it's really hard <laughs> You know, and for me, where I'm in sales and my territory is the Northeast U.S. and I live in San Diego, that's a heck of a commute. Yeah, so it, is. it makes it a little bit more difficult, but this is what we do. And uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to get back to that sort of, you know, normalcy, uh, you know, something resembling the normalcy. Hang on one second. I got to yell at Roger. Shut up. <laughs> there we go. It's the first uh, one, one of the night. One thing I think that we unfortunately won't get to experience this year, although we don't know is some of those things that literally only happen at NAM. So if you remember, like in, I believe it was 2019, there was that impromptu reunion of the David Lee Ross solo band at the, yep. at the Hilton, yep. uh, like in the ballroom, like you go in this ballroom and there's, there's the David Lee Roth band with Vi and 
Greg Bissonette and Billy Sheehan, like yep. amazing. Or the first, I always point to the first year I went, the first thing I, well, the first thing I saw was uh, Jonathan came from journey was standing behind me in line to get in. That was the first thing. <laughs> then I went to the Sabian booth and immediately standing there was Terry Bazio and Mike Portnoy. And then I immediately went to the Gibson booth where I saw uh, Brian Wilson play God Only Knows solo with just him and a guitar player. And those are the moments where, you know, you, you got to be grateful for the industry that we're in because by the time word gets out that those things are happening, they've already happened, you know, yeah, so exactly. it's right exactly. place, right time, you know. And, and I think just due to touring schedules and like you mentioned, the show getting pushed back to June, it is normally in January. Yeah. I think some of that is going to be missing just because people got prior commitments. And yeah, everybody's on tour. Yep. Everybody's on tour and all the roadies are on tour. So you have all the techs and the musicians on tour. And those would be a lot of the people that would show up to, to, to the convention. They're not the main people to go. But it's always good to see them. Yep. You know, um, you know, for me, like one of the things that I, I really enjoyed, and I'm sure you remember this too, that there's a the, in between the two hotels that are right outside the convention center. There's the Anaheim Hilton and the Anaheim Marriott, and in between there's stages uh, opposing each other, one facing one way, one facing the other way, and there's a group of people that always just come and watch the shows right outside. And there's always really good artists playing. Yeah. And I'll never forget it was 2015. And the show had just finished for the day. I believe it was Saturday. And I go up to my room and I, I was lucky enough to have a balcony that yes. overlooked this. And I'm like, wow, who's that playing? It turned out it was Stevie Wonder's band. His whole band was playing. And then Stevie Wonder got up there. Yep. And then it was like watching a Stevie Wonder concert from my hotel room. Yes. That was that was pretty badass. So. I remember and and that was one of the times. You and we we ended up going to dinner that night, and yeah. I had went back to my hotel to change or whatever. And and when I met up with you and and our friend Bob and everything, it was like you don't know what you just missed. Yeah. And I had missed yeah. I had missed Stevie Wonder. I saw on that same stage I saw Graham Nash, who I'm a huge fan of. Obviously mm -hmm. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, but his solo work as well. I saw Graham Nash play acoustic out there. I saw Doctor John before he passed. P Funk played one year. They were yep. amazing. Yep. I, I mean, there's been so many great shows that I've seen as part of that. Usually, Metal Allegiance happens, which, if you're unfamiliar, you're talking, you know, Gary Holt and Dave Lombardo and Mike Portnoy, Bobby Blitz from Overkill, and the guys from Anthrax and the guys from Mastodon. It's like a big. 25 person super group that rotates playing metal covers so if yep. you're into classic heavy metal iron maiden judas priest sabbath dio all of that you're seeing some of the greatest guys in that genre play that stuff uh, i i'll never forget seeing gary holt and alex skolnick do dual lead the solo to fast as a shark by accept it was amazing yeah. it's <laughs> always fun seeing seeing things like that so um so we'll report back next week <laughs> yes, and we'll let you know if anything happened and what it was and if it was cool or not. I know that uh, certain people that are watching are going to be showing up ball bag and uh, that's his nickname. It's not his real name, <laughs> but I think he'll be there. Oh, he just mentioned Mark from death angel. Yes. Yeah. Mark from death angel does metal allegiance as well. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, also probably will not be a name this year. <laughs> no, but you know who will be is Gary Holt. Uh, yeah, and he's going to be one of the few, like, you know, him, maybe Skolnick, maybe some of those guys that were on the Bay Area Strikes Back tour might be there for signings, but most everybody else is out. Yes. So usually this is just like an autograph fest yep. for fans. So anyway, we'll report back and give you cool updates and hopefully have some cool pictures and something incriminating to get Nick in trouble or whatever, you know, something <laughs> yeah, right. like that. Something like that. Or you. Uh, no, there won't be any of that. We'll get Roger in trouble. That's different. Roger's always in trouble anyway. In fact, oh, no, right now he's being good. Okay. No way. So, All right. So we wanted to talk today about soundtracks. And this is the meat of the matter right here. This is the main topic of our, our, our conversation uh, for today. Uh, and I, this is called Soundtracks to the Apocalypse in a joking way. And also a tip of the hat to Slayer. Yep. Uh, for their box set from 2003, Soundtrack to the Apocalypse. And so I just want to start off by explaining what the difference is between a soundtrack and a score. All right. These are two different things. A soundtrack is usually a collection of songs that were just brought in to use in the film or were recorded for the film. 
a collection of songs, whereas a score is a lot of the background music that you may not be paying full attention to, but it helps set the mood and give you that, you know, sort of like a foreboding feeling or that uneasy feeling or that happy feeling that goes along and, and works within the scene in the movie. So um, a couple of composers that would work under the scores just to kind of uh, enlighten people that may not know, like John Williams, Star Wars. Maybe the best. Yeah, probably the best. Yeah, Star Wars, Jaws, Raiders of the Lost Ark, just to name a few. So he wrote the scores for those movies. Also, Danny Elfman. Yep. All right, from Boingo Boingo, but he also composes lots of movie scores. He's done over 100 now at this point. And he did uh, Batman and Pee Wee's Play, uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and uh, what did he do recently? I uh, did one. Uh, oh, he did the new Doctor Strange movie. He's the composer on that one as well. But then there's some of the, the, the new movement, somebody like Tyler Bates, mm-hmm. who did Deadpool 2. And he's done John Wick. So he's like one of the, he's part of the new listings, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. Those are people that score movies, even though they may have bands that write songs, you know, maybe not John Williams, but the other two, uh, these guys, you know, they score movies. Now, soundtracks, which is what we're going to talk about. Yes, somebody mentioned this as far as, as far as Danny Elfman goes, Nightmare Before Christmas. And his voice actually fit Jack perfectly in that movie. He wasn't slated to be Jack to do the voice, to sing the songs for Jack. But uh, I was it Christopher uh, Sarandon. I guess his voice wasn't fitting in the music. So Danny Elfman did it. So he just wound up singing and scoring it. Um, so anyway, we're talking about soundtracks, which would basically be an album of songs that complement the film uh, or came from the film. And the first thing that I'm going to mention, the first one I'm going to go with, I'm going to see if I could do this magic magic uh thing to show you don't guys. get too and complicated actually yeah uh, let's see if this can happen if i can hit this button and do this and then stop screen i don't want to stop this oh, there we go boom there you go bill and ted's bogus journey now featuring god about- gave rock and roll to you too by kiss yes which was a cover of argent Yep, exactly. And they changed the words and gave it the Bob Ezrin treatment, of course. So. They probably you probably just so they get writing credit on it. Probably. It's <laughs> <laughs> you know, Nick, this is Gene Simmons of Kess. Um, you wouldn't be wrong in your assessment because at the time I was poor. I only had twenty million dollars in the bank. <laughs> And the producers approached us and said, would you do a song? And I said, I don't want to write a thing. So I went to Paul and I said, Paul, steal a song. Let's just change the words. And we'll get Bob Ezrin and give him $20 and a cup of coffee. Maybe we can have a hit. And we did. And they did. Again. So, yeah, actually, that is a great song. And it went up on, on Kiss's album, Revenge. Yep. So, but... Last That's recording not, to feature uh, Eric Carr, too. Actually, he didn't. Oh, he, he didn't re- play on it. He's he in the didn't video. Play on it. He's in the video, but he did not play on it. Uh, he did sing on it, though. He did sing. There's there's a there's a, a, ba- a break, and then there's like an acapella section, and he does the high parts in that section. So he is on it, but he did not play drums on it. Um, but also on this soundtrack, I, you have Slaughter, Megadeth, King's X, Faith No More, all on one soundtrack. And it was awesome because they were all songs not on their album. So it was this great compendium of awesome, I don't want to call them B-sides, but like the extra tracks that bands record that don't put albums for soundtrack purposes and things of that nature. And they all end up being really, really good. Yes. And Steve Vai does two, uh, does uh, uh, the, the Reaper rap on it. Plays, you know, like the, the he played the, all the fantastic guitar uh, in those songs. And then Jim Martin from Faith No More actually did the stellar uh, guitar work, whatever they call it. They call it the, the stellar guitar work. Uh, the Whenever they do like the air guitar things, all those noises, Jim Martin from Faith No More. Before so, he was growing pumpkins. There you go. Exactly. Now, now he plays pumpkins, uh, grows pumpkins. Um, so anyway, that's one soundtrack that I think if you don't have it, you need to check it out. Interesting note, though, if you try to use it on, on uh, try to grab it from, you know, from Apple Music, half the songs are grayed out. I don't know if there's like a publishing issue. It's got to be. Songs by, the songs by King's X and uh, Winger and a few others, like there's about 11 or 12 songs on the soundtrack and you can only listen to about six. 
That's uh, really weird. Apple Music. It's weird. I haven't tried it through Spotify, but I'm just letting you know. So uh, that's the first one I got. What do you got? Well, it was already shouted out in the comments, so I'm just going to go for that one first. Hang on. <laughs> and I think I know which one it is. Yes. Should I get out my... Yep, I was going to say, should I get out my white, my white suit? In my opinion, much better than the film is this soundtrack. The film was good. The soundtrack is far better. Yeah, I agree. I mean... This is a Bee Gees greatest hits, honestly. I mean, they were new songs. You know, they were songs recorded for this, but it might as well be their greatest hits now. I mean, you got Staying Alive, of course, Jive Talking, uh, Night Fever, the title track. Plus, there's great songs like uh, Disco Inferno by The Tramps. Uh, there's a great deep cut by Cool and the Gang called Open Sesame. Nice, funky, yes. <laughs> funky jam. Open Sesame. Yes. <laughs> And uh, and uh, I never know how to say this. Uh, the Tavares version of More Than a Woman. Before you get Tavares. to the B Tavares, before you get to the Bee Gees version of More Than a Woman. Yep, yep. And great gatefold. Yes, I'm a sucker for packaging, and this is this is an iconic gatefold. Travolta in various moves of dance funny thing about my memories of that soundtrack you know obviously i was alive when that came out unlike you and uh you were born like three weeks ago and uh <laughs> my my parents this is like a thing that always happened i don't know if it was just a new york thing or what but i found it recently at my mother's house and what my what anybody did back in the day for some reason back in the day when you would tan you'd have these foil screens Right. And you hold them just to like really get all the sun before like skin cancer was a big problem. <laughs> and so inside the album, it's covered in foil because that's what my mother used to use <laughs> to, to attract the sun. And, you know, yeah, it's so funny. There you oh. go. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, there's 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 this. I knew that was coming. Yeah. Nick. Likes also, that. Eric Singer played drums on God Gave Rock and Roll to You. Yes. Yes, he did. We yes. So, my turn. Yes. We're going to go with this one. Oh, yeah. Another John Travolta. Back to back Travoltas. <laughs> yes. 100%. Here's a, here's a conversation. Where is, which one is his hair better in? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. That's a, I think it's a tie. He looks pretty awesome in, like, on the grease cover there. Equally cool, but just different styles. You know? Yes. But the real the real deal with this is the person next to him, Olivia Newton -John. John. John, still a crush to this day for me. Thank you very much. Voice of an angel. Oh, eyes of a beauty. Um, yeah, she's just astounding. And then when she got into those tight pants at the end of the movie, I mean, come on. If you were of a certain age and you didn't fall in love with her, there is something severely wrong with you. And in fact, you didn't need to be of a certain age. All you needed to be was alive. Yep. All right. Because she was hotter than like hot back. Even then. though, and even though I was only born three weeks ago, Mike, even when I saw that, when I was yeah. a young kid, I was like, Whoa, what's, what's happening with this girl. Yeah. Back in mid May, when you first saw it, it was amazing, <laughs> but yeah, no, she was astounding. Aside from that, that we're talking about the movie, the soundtrack itself. Okay. The title track written by the Bee Gees, right? They wrote songs for everybody. Sang by Frankie Valley. Frankie Valley, yep, yep. 100%. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of songs that were written by John Farrar, who was, uh, actually wrote a lot of songs for Olivia Newton-John. Um, and he was a big-time producer in, in, in a bunch of bands back in Australia. And he wrote, um, uh, oh, what is it, You're the One That I Want and uh, hopefully, Hopelessly Devoted to You and, and a few of those other tracks. But then you have Sha Na Na, who did all those 50s covers. Mm -hmm. Like born to hand jive and all that. It's it's just a great soundtrack, and it's really hard not to smile when you're listening to the soundtrack. I mean, it's it's just really cool, and it, it, there's a a certain uh, I don't know. I, I want to say a purity to it. It's just it's just clean, you know. Yeah, it's just clean fun. And, it represents and, simpler times than the music does as well. Exactly. 100%. Plus, grease lightning. There you go. Yes, that as well. Jam. Your turn. Okay, so this, this one came up a couple of weeks ago in a different subject we were talking about. And I know it's a toss-up on if it's actually a soundtrack 
because it's considered such a monumental album. Mm. But I still consider it a soundtrack, especially if you've seen the movie Purple Rain. It's not a soundtrack. It's an album. But every song on the album is in the movie. I mean, what came first? You know, I don't know. I think they, they came. They had to come around the same time. There had to have been a plan. So we'll we'll say it qualifies because every song from that album is in that movie. Yes. And, it, and, uh, and those songs set up certain scenes in the movie, too. So I think it is, even if it's not considered an official motion picture soundtrack, I think it has a lot to do with the, 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 uh, the visual aspect of the movie. So I do fully believe they're connected. And, uh, of course, I'll go primo, with it. Yeah. primo Prince. Yeah, I mean it's it's Prince it, at his absolute finest. You, you can't deny it. It's it's the out like if if you point, hey, what should I listen to if I've never listened to Prince before? That. Yep. Um, with like not even not even a question. Uh, I'm Gino Vanelli should have done the title song. Are you referring to Greece or are you referring to Purple referring Rain? To. I think that's what he was referring to because if he was referring to Purple Rain, it's just really weird. Either way, I think Gino would have he would have done it done he it justice. It. He would have slayed it. All right, this is my next pick. Oh, yeah, that's a popular one. The single soundtrack. This album had every grunge band <laughs> out of Seattle uh, on it. I, I mean, just uh, Pearl Jam's on it, Soundgarden's on it, Allison Chains is on it. I think Wood was on it right yeah it wasn't the, the i believe that so yeah. on that on that album mud honey i believe uh screaming trees uh but for me the song seasons which is a chris cornell solo song is the best song on this whole soundtrack and it's it's absolutely it's just you know basically just him and an acoustic guitar minimal production value just really just a solid song um and jeff henderson does say State of Love and Trust is spectacular. It is. It's a great song off that album. So if you guys don't have the single soundtrack or never heard it, definitely, definitely listen to it. If you've never seen the movie, watch it. It's 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 funny. I mean, it's romantic comedy, but it's still really funny, especially since, you know, uh, Matt Damon, uh, Matt Damon, Matt uh, Dylan, Matt Dylan. Thank you. Uh, was in a band uh, in the movie with uh, everybody else from Pearl Jam. <laughs> essentially and he was uh it was called what citizen uh citizen dick i think so yeah that sounds right i've only and, seen parts bits and pieces of that movie yeah and the the lead track from their album was touch me i'm dick so for that alone it's 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 worth seeing the movie well you mentioned chris cornell with an acoustic and that's the best you're ever going to hear chris cornell is when it's his voice and an acoustic oh, yeah. guitar oh, which absolutely let me just tie this back in because we were just talking about Nam. Remember the year at Nam where I go, Mike, who's who's uh, who's going to be featured at your booth? And you're like, oh well, Joe Walsh is playing, and Chris Cornell's going to be doing a set. And I said, wow, really, Chris Cornell? And you said, no, I'm lying. Yeah, neither of them were at our booth. <laughs> and I said, you bastard. Booth. Joe Walsh did buy you know one of our guitars recently though. So. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm not against it. All right, Nick, your turn. What you got? Okay, so one of the things I <laughs> one of the things I'm I collect and I have a lot of in my record collection are what's known as black exploitation soundtracks. And what these were were they were sort of B movie underground movies in some cases in the 70s yep. that focused around black culture and black music and all kinds of crazy subject matter that most of the time wasn't touched until they they made those movies so there yeah. is classic ones which we're going to touch on but uh there's also some some uh like i said b and c level movies that have just great scores that were recorded by people like james brown and herbie hancock and uh uh, who 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 am I? Oh, Edwin Starr. There's a great soundtrack called "Hell Up in Harlem" by Edwin Starr, who most people know as uh, the guy who did "War" and uh, "25 Miles," the classic Motown track. So, as these movies grew in popularity, the the higher the profile people were that participated in the soundtracks. But 
there's there's two that stand out, of course, that I think represent the entire genre. This is one of them, and that is Shaft. Nice. Of course, Isaac Hayes, the yeah, man. Recorded by Isaac Hayes and his fantastic band. And uh, as you were t- explaining at the beginning about what's different, the difference between a score and a soundtrack, this is a mixture of both. So yeah, you that have blurred the lines. Yes, you have the song, which everybody knows, of course, you know, theme from Shaft. But there's all kinds of stuff like walk, walk from Regios and Shaft's Cab Ride. These are just the instrumental tracks that are setting up those scenes in the movie. So those are all created um, or recreated on this soundtrack. Again, a two LP set, extremely popular, and another great gatefold, which features an advertisement for Isaac Hayes's other fantastic albums, including Hot Buttered Soul and Black Moses. But this soundtrack, <laughs> this soundtrack, you can usually find it. Look, I paid two bucks for the for this copy, and it's and $2. it's very dollars. It's very clean. Uh, this is a great soundtrack. It's it's a must have in your collection, and. Uh, great musicianship on it can't say enough about it but uh, i think it represents a whole genre of of great soundtracks i agree it, they were so funky yes you know, i mean superfly is another one you could have brought up superfly you know that they're all you know all that that whole genre is kind of overlooked yep you know, i i think unfortunately uh, but somebody who doesn't overlook a lot of those songs is quentin tarantino no, he, he and a lot of people, I think, went back and revisited those movies and specifically the music. Thanks to Quentin Tarantino. You hear a lot of it in Jackie Brown and, of course, Pulp Fiction. Yep. That's my next pick is Pulp Fiction. So, I mean, this soundtrack was from from the from the opening song through the entire album. I, I mean, you know, uh, with Dick Dale doing Miserloo right at the beginning, opening the song. And then you have, you know. Uh, Al Green and you have uh, just uh, just a whole array so much great stuff so many great songs on there but the thing that I tr- I really did that really I- ingratiated me to, to this album were, were, was having the clips the audio clips from the movie in between each track you know very much like you did with Reservoir Dogs another great soundtrack for yes. that matter um, you know, but every Quentin Tarantino soundtrack offers something. That's what I was know. just going to say. You can't go wrong with any of no. his soundtracks. Yeah. The, the guy for as, for as crazy as he is and for as much of a movie maven as he is really had his finger, you know, in the light socket of, of, of seventies music and, and knew, you know, exactly what songs to pick for his movies that would work perfectly, you know, and this is probably the epitome of it. Pulp Fiction soundtrack. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Yes. He's a huge record collector too. He he's been spotted a couple of times in town at various record stores and digging for crazy stuff. He likes crazy soul 45s, which is probably how he ended up on a lot of those songs yep. he ended up using. And he's also a big 8-track tape collector. So, wow. As okay. is Glenn Danzig. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're next. <laughs> Moving on. I well, I only know that cuz the same r- record store fed the addiction for both of those guys so next one i'm going with is an eclectic collection of music Uh, a lot of people point at this and say it might be the best soundtrack of all time at least in modern times because of its versatility and that is the soundtrack to forrest gump nice good call that was actually one of mine that i had too did you okay so great stuff great stuff on here from from rebel rouser by Dwayne eddie which is a a deep cut by by all intents and purposes joan baez uh the birds harry nielsen all the way up to the doors and skinnard and gladys knight and the pips and the doobie brothers obviously we all know the movie it it uh it goes over an entire period of life so in that i i've always loved how you get you could tell what era we're in by the music that you're hearing. So this is a fantastic collection of music. Even if you're not a fan of the movie, it's uh great, great stuff. This version is the uh, Mac daddy version, three LP triple gatefold. And I believe it's on uh red, white, and blue colored vinyl. There's, there's the red right there available for sale at rock city music company. Oh, well, why don't you pitch your store while you're at it? <laughs> Most of what I show is always my own collection. Yeah. Every episode we've done, but this one, I didn't have a copy of it, but we did. So I'm glad we did. 
I have a lot of this on CD. I don't have it on album, so I can't be like, look. Yeah, that counts. Really work. CD still counts. Yeah, I guess. Uh, all right. What do I got next? Uh, why, did I, why did I get rid of this? All right. This one. This one. This is a great soundtrack. The Less Ooh. Than Zero soundtrack. I'm unfamiliar. Whoops. And I just made it go away. There we go. <laughs> so the Less Than Zero soundtrack, the movie was okay. Um, it was a lot of like semi brat packers uh, were in it, but it was like, you know, uh, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Andrew, uh, well, whoever that guy is, Andrew, I can't remember his name. Um, but the soundtrack was amazing. It's got, it's where Hazy Shade of Winter by the Bangles comes from. So their version of Hazy Shade of Winter, uh, which was a huge hit in the mid eighties on pop radio covering the Simon and Garfunkel soundtrack, uh, Simon and Garfunkel song. Uh, Slayer does Inagata DeVita on this soundtrack. Danzig is on this soundtrack. Public Enemy is on this soundtrack. Joan Jett is on this soundtrack. It's, it's Aerosmith is on this soundtrack. LL Poison. Cool J is on this soundtrack. It's all over the map. It's like every genre of music is represented <laughs> on this. And Roy Orbison's on it too. So, I mean, it's got something for everybody on this soundtrack. And again, a lot of them are cover songs, but a lot aren't. Like Public Enemy does bring the, you know, it's Public Enemy's Bring the Noise on there. But again, if you're looking for something, it's going to give you a little bit of everything. And where the soundtrack is, you know, some people, this is kind of like a cult film now. A lot of people like it. Um, I haven't watched it in a million years, so I can't give an opinion on it, but the soundtrack is great. And so I wanted to definitely wanted to mention that one. Well-rounded collection. It really is. So this is the one I teased earlier back in rotation. It happens once a year, usually because it is that good. And Mike, you mentioned it just a moment ago. Super fly. There you go. The ultimate my favorite soundtrack of all time. And again, because I have to do it every week, Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab version. Mo two, two LP mastered at 45. Nice. The ultimate sounding version of this record that I have, at least. And I've got quite a few versions of it. My only complaint is, is I wish they would have replicated the die cut sleeve that's on the original and on some of the reissues where the Superfly logo flips open. And there's some cast credits and stuff back there. A couple, a couple scenes from the film, but they did replicate that on the uh, inner sleeve. So you'd still get the packaging, but I wish they would have went the extra mile and done that die cut there. But let's talk about the songs. You got, of course, the title track "Superfly," but also "Pusher Man," "Freddy's Dead." We want to talk about funky rock and roll. This is where the top of the mountain is, if you ask me. Nice. The great I, Curtis I, look, Mayfield. It's, Curtis Mayfield is just astounding. So uh, highly sampled by the Beastie Boys. <laughs> yes. Highly sampled by everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a, a lot of those grooves and, and drum beats and fills and what have you from all those Curtis Mayfield songs from, you know, popular Curtis Mayfield songs from back in the day. It's just undeniable. That's another one, too, that bridges that gap between yeah. soundtrack and score. You get some of the instrumental just. Yep. <laughs> it's not quite brown cow chicken brown cow but no you know, it's, it's one step away from it it's got more feeling than that actually yeah exactly <laughs> one one step away from the brown chicken brown cow um this is i have this one and one more but i gotta go with this one i love this movie i love this soundtrack and i mean come on oh yeah the this title track is so much fun it's so much fun to listen to because they're all new songs that were written in a specific style and they they did it really well, you know, and, and Tom Hanks actually wrote lyrics on a lot of these songs, too, because he produced the movie. And I don't know if he directed it, but he's definitely in it. Uh, as you can see, he's in the middle there. But if you haven't seen the movie, it's a great movie. It's a lot of fun. You know, um, this is the antithesis of another uh, album that I couldn't find a cover of, but it should be. Well, I'll talk about that one next because it's my last one. But uh, uh, and again, it's one of those that's debatable whether or not it's actually a soundtrack, but it is. Uh, but this is the antithesis of that soundtrack. So uh, that thing you do, the title track, like you said, Mike Viola from the Candy Butchers singing on it. Um, Adam, 
Schlesinger, uh, uh, right? Am I getting his name right? Yeah, yeah, from Fountains of Wayne, yeah. Yeah, from Fountains of Wayne. I I think he passed away recently. He did. He was one of the first people to pass from COVID. Yeah. That's famous right. people that that's right. in yeah. the music world. And it's a shame because, I mean, what an incredible songwriter. I mean, the, the guy wrote almost all the music on this album. And, you know, Fountains of Wayne may not have gained a ton of popularity, but they were a great power pop band. You know? Yes. Um, Utopia Parkway, their album Utopia Parkway is 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 a great album. If you haven't checked it out, yep. it's one to listen to. Um, but, yeah, check this album out if you haven't. It's just, again, it's, it's just like clean fun uh, as far as the album goes. So uh, check it out. Uh, I got one more after this, but Nick, what do you got? I'm out of records to show, but there's one more that I wanted to spotlight and, of course, talk about. Because, again, similar to that thing you do, is it a soundtrack? Is it an album? Can't go any further without mentioning Spinal Tap. And now I don't have any more to show. (laughs) Well, you show it, and then we can both talk about it because it's both our last pick. Then I, I, I don't worry about it. We could just talk about it. It's all good. I mean, I could, I could scrounge up one more. I actually do have one more if we wanted to. But let's talk about Spinal Tap. So, is it a soundtrack? Is it an album? It was an album that it was an album created for a movie, essentially. So, I guess so. I think it is. And I think technically the label reads that it's a motion picture soundtrack. Take the lead for a second. Roger is about to cause some trouble, so I'm just going to. Roger's causing trouble here, so we're going to talk about Spinal Tap. Oh, there we go. I, I got center stage here. Spinal Tap, if you haven't seen it, is the most essential rock and roll movie of all time. Uh, Christopher Guest, comedic genius as Nigel Tufnell, and the songs that were written along with the uh, film could not be more perfect you got the long epic in stonehenge you got the british pop of cups and cakes you got the uh power ballad of america you've got the rocking throwdown that is hellhole rock and roll creation which of course the great line in the movie what day did god create spinal tap and couldn't he have rested on that day too Shark sandwich. It was just a two word review. Shit, Shit sandwich. sandwich. <laughs> what about what about the comedic brilliance of the album cover of Intravenous De Milo? Yeah, I mean, like it, it was almost like the other album names they made were better than whatever they could have. You know, like I just I want more. And a new album, a new movie is coming out. Another Spinal Tap movie is coming out. So I don't know if they're gonna. I don't know how this is going to work. They're all like 90. Um, maybe not that old, but still, you know. They're in the late 60s. It's got to be. Oh, yeah. The early 70s, I think. For a couple I hope they so. play. I hope they play. That would be the greatest thing ever to see Spinal Tap in person. I ran it to them at NAMM. Spinal Tap? In what year was that? I mean, I saw Derek Smalls there a couple years ago, which was hilarious. Or 99 or 2000. Wow. And, um, yeah, you were like, you know, eight days old or whatever. And uh, I was with uh, Rob Zombie's guitar player, Riggs. And at the time, everybody smoked. So we we're outside having a cigarette. And we came in and the bathrooms are right, right inside. And Riggs had maybe had had a couple of Jägermeisters. And he saw Michael McKeon and he went right up to him. He, and they weren't dressed as Spinal Tap. They were just in their They were playing that night, but they weren't dressed. And he went up to him and said, like, hey, I want to play guitar for your band. I want to play guitar in your band. And like Michael McKean was just like humoring him along. Christopher Guest was like, okay, that's enough. Let's go. Let's yeah, right. Go. <laughs> Total straight. Meanwhile, Harry Shear was just like, this is fun. <laughs> Do you remember a couple of years ago at NAM where they had Derek Smalls judge the Ampeg bass player contest? No. Yeah, he came out, you know, dressed as Derek Smalls and then just proceeded to like insult every bass player that played. It was hilarious. He's like, well, that's too many notes. He kept saying that. And then uh, they introduced one guy when we were standing there, and he said, the only reason this gentleman is here is to show that he's man enough to wear a Tesla shirt in public. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, my God. But Spinal so Tap, I mean, it's it's the ultimate soundtrack. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. How could you not end on Spinal Tap? You know, we were both we were both there. So uh, obviously it was it was the one to end on. Um, uh, 
Mike, it is Gene Summons. We're just wondering why you did not pick music from The Elder. Or Detroit Rock City from 1999. That was not necessarily a Kiss album. We made money on that album with licensing. But there was also the great Kiss deep cut. Nothing can keep me from you. Which is true, and we made some money. But The Elder, even though we didn't make the movie <laughs> thank we god should look at it as a soundtrack maybe unrealized <laughs> find it on kiss.com there's a 50th anniversary pressing on picture disc vinyl for 300 dollars tag price we've put it out 10 years early to <laughs> advance the, the funds so it is a 40th anniversary of the elder done on a 50th anniversary pressing kiss.com 29 you gotta get kiss it's kissonline.com i want to send you to the wrong address <laughs> so you'll look and buy twice as much once you get there because you will forget the actual address and we need the money frankly pull up mark garney's comment of almost famous probably my favorite soundtrack that's a great one that is a great soundtrack. Absolutely. I, I can't say I, uh, I disagree with them there, too. But um, there are so many great soundtracks. And again, these are just our opinions. There, there are so many soundtracks. And more and more, like, in, it really started in the 90s where it really started becoming a, an income generator for, for the, to support the movie in a lot of ways. Like Howard Stern's Private Parts. There's, there's another great soundtrack. So, you know, th there's lots of great uh, the, the crow too, the crow and the crow too. You yeah. Know, good fellas. Good fellas. Yeah. Th these are all great soundtracks. So, uh, these are just our opinions. Again, it's not a top 10 list. Cause again, as we always say, top 10 lists are wrong. Hang on. Shut up. And, uh, he's barking in the other room at like the wall or something and not the album, like a literal wall. So anyway, with that said, we got our last two segments, and then we're going to call it a night because Nick is uh, got to get on a plane in the AM, and we want him to get some sleep because he didn't get any. Hopefully, he gets some tonight. Then that'd be really, really nice. I'd like um, to hope so. Shut up! Although the, the the things this day brought on, I don't know how easy it's going to be to rest my head. You'll figure it out. I'm pretty sure you'll figure it out. So, with that said, we are moving on to. Oh, I'm going to kill the dog. Hang on. Damn. I, I, when I have to mute the microphone to yell at the dog, you know it's bad. So, anyway, we're moving on to Discovered. Old. Time for Discovered, where we discuss a cover song that we like as much, if not more, than the original. Now, last week I started, which means that Nick starts this time. And what you got for us, boss? Okay, so this one... I think you may have used in an earlier episode, but it's so great that it needs to be talked about always. Okay. And that is Judas Priest cover of Green Monolishi. I have not. That was not used in a previous one. No. Okay. Nope. Uh, Fleetwood Mac, yep. Peter Green era Fleetwood Mac. It's a slow, I don't want to say dirge because that's kind of a negative way to look at it, but it's a slow blues. And the way Priest did it totally turned that thing on its head. Great vocal performance from, from Rob Halford. Dueling lead guitar solos with Tipton and, and Downing. It's it's the ultimate, it's one of one of the ultimate choices, again, like all on the Watchtower, of taking a song that was one way and doing it completely different, making it their own. It is one of the Judas Priest classics. And it's not even their song. So no. when you go when you go see Judas Priest, people go ballistic when they start Green Monolishi, and it's for good reason because it's one of the best Priest songs, even though it's not a Priest song. Yeah. So one of one of my ultimate favorite cover tracks, Judas Priest, Green Monolishi with the two prong crown, taking a Fleetwood Mac slow blues, which is great in its own right, and turning it in, it's into a metal anthem. Props to the props to the priest machine. Priest machine props. <laughs> Amen and hallelujah. Cool. That's a great pick. It's a great pick. It's a great song. I agree with you. I mean, you know, if anybody, the thing is a lot of people probably even have not even heard the original. 
Right. You know, so they don't know what to compare it to. And again, everybody goes nuts for it, like you said, at pre-shows, because they don't know that it's, or may, they're maybe just not aware that it's a cover tune. They maybe thought that somebody else wrote it. You know, and they were the and it's unrecognizable it. if you don't know what you're what you're listening to right yeah. until the vocals come in. If yep. you just hear that guitar riff and how it starts, you would never think those are the same song. Nope, nope. No, that's a good choice. That's a good choice. I really have to start a playlist for the covers, and I haven't done that yet. I really you have to. I, I do have the "This Song Sucks" playlist, which is in the in the description below here on on YouTube. If you want to check it out, um, we'll get to that in a minute. But as far as my cover. Um, I, you know, I had like 20 different covers running through my head, um, this week. It was harder to choose one, not because I couldn't think of one. It's because I thought of too many. And, um, the one that I came up with is, is sort of in tribute to the fact that this album is being reissued on June 18th by a band called Voivod. The album is called Nothing Face, and the song is called Astronomy Domine or Astronomy Domine, depending on who you are. Yes. Uh, but it's Pink Floyd. It's a Pink Floyd song that was redone by Voivod on the Nothing Face album, and it slays the original. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Sid even Sid Barrett close. era Pink Floyd, too. Yes. Yeah. Piper, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, I think it's on. Yep. Right? Um, so, but it absolutely slays it. Absolutely slays it. And uh, not because the original is bad. It's just this version is so good and it's it's true to the original but it's obviously amped up a bit it's thick it's heavy it's got a chaotic solo um the the vocals are on point and, and just as haunting as the original just a really great cover tune and it follows uh, the original arrangement pretty yeah. pretty authentically i think yep. but it's just thick you know it's yeah. it's just heavy you know because it's I mean, we're, we're not talking about, a, you know, the drums definitively uh, have a lot more beef to them. You know, just it just sounds more chaotic and uh, in the best way possible, I, I, I guess, is, is the way I could describe it. So that would be my pick for this week. If you guys haven't heard it, you can check it out on YouTube or on June 18th, Record Store Day. Nothing Face will be re-released on LP. Um, buy it at Rock City Music Company. There you go. Got it. Uh, this song sucks. Here we go. I, uh, I'm going to let you go first again. Okay. Cause so, I want to um, get my yelling out of the way. <laughs> no, because here's the thing. We've been avoiding this one for, oh, we? for a few episodes. We talked about, sp about spotlighting this and I'm just taking it because it's so terrible and, <laughs> and it needs to be, it needs to be agreed upon on how terrible it is. So, I'm okay. doubling down on my Judas Priest, and I'm calling them out for their terrible cover of Johnny B. Good. You know, that was the only reason why anybody would have bought the album Ram It Down, I guess. Right? That was on Ram It Down, right? I think it might be on Turbo. No, it's not on Turbo. Then it's got to be on Ram It Down. Yeah, I think it's on Ram It Down. Um, it's not good. It's far from good. It's not even close to good. It's one of the, it's the worst match of a cover of all time. I mean, I like I can't think of a worse idea than asking Judas Priest to do a Chuck Berry song. <laughs> I mean, think about that out loud. Who convinced them and who thought that was a good I mean, there's so there's so many oh, levels of like and this is not about Johnny B. Good. The song Johnny B. Good is, you know, a, a you know, a true rock and roll classic. But who told Judas Priest to do it? I mean, you, what I just said about Green Monolishi and the creative aspect of what they did with it to then take something like Johnny B. Good and do it so horribly. It's like, but I don't think they could have ever done it good. Like, it's got nothing to do with skill level. It's the fact that Judas Priest should not be playing Johnny B. Good. You are, you're right. Uh, I, I agree. Maybe not as vehemently as you. Like, you definitely... Like if if this song was a child, you would beat it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of where you are with it, um, and uh, I I can't say that's necessarily wrong. Um, I I just don't know if I'm as violently against it as you. Maybe because you lived through it. I did. It's a lot, but that didn't make it any better. But it's know? a lot easier to hate it in hindsight. Uh, well, yeah. Th this is. <laughs> In hindsight, I hate it less. No, usually you you wind up like 
going back and saying like, no, why did I even like that in the first place? Um, sorry, I have to look up the name of this song because I can't remember the exact name uh, of it from mine. But yeah, in, in the end, I mean, you're right. Just just the thought process process of Judas Priest covering a Chuck Berry song is is just sort of like egregious at, at best. So yeah, I'm I'm with you on that one. Um, mine, I'm going with a Kiss tune. Uh oh. You should have told me you were going with Kiss tune because then I could have came up with one. But no, go no, ahead. Well, there, but the thing is, th- there's for as many great Kiss songs there are, there's equally as many terrible Kiss songs. So this this segment will, will never run dry. This well will never be empty. You know, I'm not I'm not too worried about it. Um, but this is on the album <laughs> Hot in the Shade. Oh. And the song is called Cadillac Dreams. <laughs> You could have went a couple directions with the album. (laughs) I could have. But this is during a particular period of time when Gene Simmons didn't want to write crap. And all he did was write crap. He leaned on other people to write songs. He's like, no, I, um, listen, I need to phone this in because I'm needed on set. I was going to say he was making movies. I'm needed on set. The movie will never come out. And if the movie ever does come out, it'll come out in blockbuster video. Um, that's kind of where he was during that time. And this song is just a bag of shit. It's it's not their finest moment. I I, I got to look up the lyrics. Um, I was going to say there's some lyrics in here that really represent your point. Yeah, it's just like, was he asleep? In the meantime, while you're looking that up, you got to put up David Swick's comment that says, love that song. Of, of, yeah, of course he loves that song because, well, he's, you know, ducky. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> this, I mean, if this song does not epitomize Gene Simmons in some so many ways, just let's go with these lines. I'm going to read it in his voice. This is, this is uh, uh, recited lyrics with Gene Simmons. Excuse me. Um, I just want money. Money. That's all I need. I've got Cadillac dreams. Hey, mister, don't you take it from me. Give me money. Money. More than I need. These Cadillac dreams are waiting on me. Didn't have the time of day till this dream was born. You can't take that away. You can't take that away from me. I don't think you need to go any further. I'm not. Because th- this th- just so. I just I'm reading the lyrics again. They're just so absolutely horrible. I, it's not good. It's not good. But I I still think there's there's worse. There are worse. But this is a bag of shit. It's still a bag of shit. It's an absolute bag of shit. Are there bigger bags of shit? Yes. Yes. There are much larger sacks with more excrement in it from this same band but for our purposes today this is good enough because it's been a long day (laughs) it has and i think we both can agree that this song just it's yeah i can't yeah i'm not gonna argue with you that it's good yeah oh well i i think david liked my reading (laughs) of of uh i mean what does it say here when i was 17 there was this beauty queen checked into a one room suite, the back seat of my car. <laughs> who who else but Gene? This guy, you know, was hammering share it one time, and these are the lyrics he can think of. This is the best he can come up with. I like you how know? hammer and share in your mind would dictate that you could kill, come up with better lyrics. But think about it. Like he nailed share Diana Ross, like a ton, of, probably Donna summer and like could not come up with somebody who could write better lyrics to write. Like, come on, come on. It's not about, you know, being a pipe layer strictly in, in that sense of the word. It's like using the pipe laying to get you somebody in the industry who could write better lyrics than this roger can write better lyrics than this and he can't talk (laughs) he can bark though he oh he can bark and that would be fine 
you know, there's some bands out there. There's a band called K-Ninus. They're a death metal band that has a dog as a lead singer. And why not? They sound pretty good. Anyway. I'll look that up. Jeff Henderson, also known as Ballbag, is saying, I cannot do a good impression of Gene Simmons. But what he doesn't know is that I'm actually doing an impression of Peter Chris. What's happening, baby? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. All right. So that's all we got for this week. I think it's time to call it quits because we're just about to start getting into bed. Uh, we're going to get start getting into fights with people in the in the chat. And yes. That's enough for now, uh, especially since, you know, every other Gene song is about being a pipe layer. <laughs> yes, that is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. And let's let's give a shout out to, to Mr. Garney, who says my my Gene, my Gene impression is uncanny. So I'm I'm appreciative to you, Mr. Garney. Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, anybody have any questions? No? Great. We're done. Uh, thank you all so much for watching again. My name is Mike. That is, uh, that's, I'm pointing the wrong direction. That's, that's Nick over there. He's over there. Oh, there's the camera. There's Nick. And down there is Roger. I know that for sure. And uh, we'll talk to you all next week. Uh, You'll see on uh, Monday what kind of topic we're going to come up with. Since we're going to be together this weekend, we'll figure out something. And I'm sure that we'll probably just get into a lot of trouble at NAMM. Actually, Nick will. Again, I can't. I can't lose my job. But Nick owns his business, and nobody can fire him. So The jury's out on that. (laughs) (laughs) We're We're about 20. Where's Rock City Music? Livonia, Michigan. Check it out. The address, the web address, or the street address? A web address. Why not? RockCityMusicCo.com. And Mike, go. we're about 24 hours away from a Cadillac margarita. Actually, 25. It's got to be 730 because I got I think I got something to do up until 6. 730. Uh, see you then. Yeah, I'm all about it. And the King Ranch burrito. Ducky's going to eat it. No, he's not. He's not. I don't think he's going to give up being a vegan for that. He gave up uh, being a vegan last week to try his own signature hot sauce for his band. What was in it? Butter? No, it was. What? No, he, he tried it on wings. That was oh, the deal. Oh, okay. And yeah. then his stomach exploded from not eating real protein for the past however many months. I don't know. You'd have to ask him. He didn't. He didn't disclose that information. That's fair. All right, everybody. Thank you again. Uh, For those of you that are watching, if you want (laughs) to double back and listen to this in about an hour, this will be up on uh, Apple Music, uh, Apple uh, Podcasts and Spotify. Make sure you click like and make sure you click subscribe and make sure you click all the things. And, you know, as Jeff uh, eloquently said right here, these are the only words that we can live uh, leave you with, which is F that burrito. You are absolutely correct, Jeff as you cram it in your behind because you want to F that burrito in the worst way. So uh, that's about it, y'all. Thank you so much. Talk to you next week. Bye.